Thanks very much for having me, inviting me to book. I'm not that pressure, and I am. I think in the last 20 years, I've traveled 24 days in a month. At least I'm on the road. And I don't travel comfortably. I travel in jeeps, I travel in buses. Sometimes when I was younger, I even took lifts in lorries and trucks. So my body is tired, but my spirit is not. So I come to you with greetings from India, and we think we'll win it in the Philippines. And I want to share with you some of our battles. In 1990, I have recirculated a piece of paper which is like this, it says anatomy of a people's campaign in the dialectic. This is just to give you an idea and courage to carry on, which you have in plenty anyway, but just more strength to your elbow. Because we started fighting for information many, many years ago in India. But the kind of campaign that I have been part of began in 1990. So it was a struggle. Let me tell you that the first Freedom of Information Act that was passed by our Indian Parliament was passed by our right-wing government under pressure from the Supreme Court because they had to pass the bill. A minister had threatened to resign because information was not being given. And the Supreme Court, he asked to place all the papers of the Ministry of Land and Urban Development in New Delhi in the public domain and there's much corruption in the department. There was a great flurry in the Prime Minister's office. They wanted to not disclose the information. But when he went to the Supreme Court, they had no option. So the Supreme Court said, you disclose the information, it's public information. And the government said, we pass a law. So there's no need for this one ministry to go public. All ministries will go public and they published, a day. they passed an extremely diluted and very bad law called the Freedom of Information Act. When we went to the ministry, which was the dealing with this act, and we said, when will you notify it? You know what they told us, unofficially, of course. They said, you can wait forever. You can pass an act, but if you don't notify it, it's not law. You can't use it. So they said, wait forever. England took four years. So you can take as long as we wish. From there onwards, in any case, our demand, as Tony points out, from the beginning and the first draft was a right to information law. The first draft of the Indian Act was made in 1996 under the chairmanship of an ex-judge of the Supreme Court, who was then chairperson of the Press Council of India. The battle had begun in 1994 on ground. We were sitting on strikes all over Rajasthan and the campaign was born in Delhi, and the campaign and the struggle had a dialectic. I really come to talk because the law without people is meaningless. It's for people. And people without the law are completely powerless. So the relationship between the law and the people had to be worked out, and that is our politics today. I am a non-party political person, so is my organization. In India, we have a non-party political movement in which we call ourselves socio-political activists. We say that in a democracy, we have the power to act and we are, the Indian constitution says, we, the sovereign, give ourselves, we, the people of India, give ourselves this constitution. We describe ourselves as the sovereign and people who are in parliament and power are servants. So the shift of power had to take place in our minds. People have to understand that that person in parliament is my representative. I have sent that person there and he or she is answerable to me. That change has now occurred into a very large degree in India after many battles, but there's always a million mutinies. It cannot be one mutiny. So you have someone asking for food, someone asking for pills in the dispensary, you have someone asking for papers. It's a multi-pronged attack. But what I've come to tell you is, what happened yesterday is a one more historic incident and maybe it will strengthen the campaign much more. And I think there's no need to feel that if you don't know it now, it will not happen. They cannot not give it to you if it's a democracy. If the Philippines is a democracy, they have to give it to you. There is no choice. And the problem is that they do not want to share power. 
And I have some clips which I'll show you later, just to show how we have fought it. But basically, I'd like to go through this process. The importance of a struggle, and I think there are enough struggles in the Philippines, have to become visible. And it's where the, the media plays a very strong role. So if these struggles are visible to the politicians and they know that they are going to lose their vote, they will do anything. Because after all, without that vote, they can't get the seats of power. In India, we played this card quite effectively. Because what we've done is, before every general elections, we've really built up the tempo. We've gone, we've protested, we've, we've done mass protests, we've, you know, we got them into their manifestos, into the political manifestos. When they got into the political manifestos, they've asked for compliance, bringing in democracy and saying it's accountability. You made a promise, you have to do it. And I'll give you one or two examples. In the initial years, in this paper you have the details, so you can go through it. I won't go through it. It's quite long. It's a very long history. What happened was that in 1993-94, we thought the way we had fought it had to change. In India, since Gandhi, we have Gandhiji, we call G for respect in India. Since the time of Mahatma Gandhi, we start on fast unto death as a means of protest, non-violent protest. So instead of killing them, we try and kill ourselves. So we sit down and we don't eat. And if you're an honest activist, you won't eat. There are people who sit and eat on the sly, but we don't. So every time our friends sat, we also died with them. Because well, you know, we wonder whether the kidneys were failing. The sixth day, no response from government. Seventh day, no response from government. You're going to the same chaps who are denying you everything and saying, please, please do it. So we're protesting outside and begging inside. Seemed completely contradictory to us. So after two hunger strikes, the second hunger strike we actually won because we played our cards very judiciously and cleverly. We decided no more hunger strikes. Because it reduces us to a complete jelly, you know, we don't know. And there we are completely fractioned by dichotomized, you know, we're fighting outside and pleading inside, no more. So what do we do? We decided we'll have public hearings. We'll have people out in the open. We'll have people saying what it is. And then let's fight, but let's fight on our strengths and not our weaknesses. So we had a set of public hearings in which we made some demands. We got some information out. And the first persons to encourage us in this were honest civil servants and honest politicians who said, get after these people. So they said, they told us how we could get the information out. I had a small period in the civil service myself, so I had a little bit of idea how things worked inside government. So we went and copied things by hand, came out, brought these documents, distributed the information, and hell broke rules in Rajasthan and army villages. They said, good lord. Dead people's names on the labor list. Good Lord, bills passed for stones. No stone was supplied. And there was tremendous anger. So that anger was channelized. We had these public hearings. There were protests. And then the chief minister of Rajasthan said, no, we have state chief ministers and the political leaders. And he made public announcements that he would give us this and that and the other. And he didn't give it. And he even said it in the state assembly. So we called after them for two things. One is that there is a right to transparency, and the second that there is a demand for accountability. That if you say something as an elected representative, we just have to give it. There is no choice. They said we were extremists. The chief minister called me and said, you know, we have a lot of extremists in India called Maoists. We call them Naxal Naxalites. He called me and said, oh, I think, you know, you should go and train to be a Naxalite. In southern India, I don't belong to Rajasthan. So he said to me, go back to your own states and learn to be a good nurse. And I said to him, you're training me very well here in Rajasthan. How nationalism should come, because when you deny people everything, they become extremists. If you give us legal recourses, we won't. So what are you trying to do? So in that battle, finally, in this dialectic, we had these series of public hearings. Eminent people from all over the 